Hello. Uh, welcome to another session of Art Saturday. Uh, thank you for joining us on this week session. Uh, my name is Zipo Zimbosi Daile. I am your host and curator for the sessions. I am not alone. I'm with uh, Malik and Donna and Jago on the technical side. And I'm also with uh, Bridget Thompson and Abdul Kadir, who are uh, the filmmakers who have produced South African Arts Past and Present, as well as other presentations, exhibitions, and publications that we have been uh, reviewing in the last 12 weeks of Art Saturday. Um, thank you for joining us as we speak on the work of uh, what, who a lot of people consider as a master weaver, Mr. Joseph Nkrofu. Today in this session, we have invited three guests who will help us discuss the work after we've seen the film on Bra Joe. We have Nguli Mlange Nipe, as well as Sibabarwe Ndrana and Mongiwe Segisu, who will join us in a very few minutes. Uh, today marks the 12th and the last week for 2021, uh, where Art Saturday is concerned. We will then um, be launching a new program in the coming new year, 2022. Hopefully, you will join us then. If you are not uh, subscribed onto our mailing list, you can uh, just go to artinubuntu.org's website. And at the bottom of the website, on the first page, uh, subscribe onto our mailing list. Uh, you will be able to receive all the information on the next year's program, which is also likely going to be about 10 or 12 sessions. Uh, before we get into the discussive part of the session, let's go and watch this short form on Brajo and then come back and discuss. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you to uh, everyone else that's joining us now. Uh, I hope you all got a chance to uh, watch the film and didn't miss out on anything. But if you did, uh, perhaps the discussion will also be interesting uh, enough for everybody. I would like to give a very warm and special welcome to uh, Babu Joseph Glovo's contemporaries and uh, very close friends that are here with us today, uh, Dada Vincent Baloyi, who is uh, with Dada Charles Ngosi. Thank you so much for being uh, here today. And I am hoping that later on, after we've heard from our speakers, that you will also share some little stories on uh, Dada Joseph. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers. We have three speakers today, Sibabalo uh, Nkwana, and we have Kuli um, Mlange Nipeg, and we also have Mongiwe Sekiso. Uh, I would like to introduce the first speaker, and I will read their very short biographies. Uh, thereafter, I would like if the speakers could uh, uh, give us their five or six minute introductions, uh, starting with Sibabalo, then Kuli, and then Bongi. Uh, Sbabalu Nkwana is a textile maker employing the unique process of traditional weaving methods combined with natural dyeing processes. In doing so, she works to keep an ancient practice alive while driving creative innovation in the industry and championing sustainable design. She uses plant-based pigments for dyeing raw yarn fabrics and fibers, uh, using experimental textile design inspired by imagination, nature, science, culture, and tradition of indigenous African textile making, and incorporating natural mater materials such as turmeric, root eucalyptus leaves, fain boss, bark, timber, to produce unique colors. Uh, welcome, Swabaru, and thank you for joining us. And then, originally from Gachiso on the west of Johannesburg, 
We have Nkulim Langeniberg, who is a creative entrepreneur, designer, and founder of the Ninevai, an award-winning collaborative platform and design studio. She graduated from the Kers Pilot School of Innovation and Design in 2016 and has participated in numerous exhibitions in the African continent uh, and in Europe. She spent some time traveling in South America, visiting rivers in Peru, Colombia, and uh, Ecuador, and learning about the craft in, the, in those regions. She has also collaborated with rivers in Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland, and South Africa, and currently works with women rivers in the Karoo and surrounding areas. Hi, Nkuli. And then lastly, but not least, we have uh, Bongi Wetleki, so holds a master's degree, uh, degree in museum and heritage studies, including visual studies from the University of the Western Cape, where she's also enrolled in a PhD a curator working for the Stellenbosch University's MMLC. She has previously worked at Iziko National um, Gallery in the role of assistant curator working for several projects, including materiality, fill in the gaps, when dust settles, not the usual suspects, and the untold stories. She is particularly interested in museum and heritage as a medium for intercultural discourse. Hello, Bong. Uh, welcome again to ATA today. Smabalu, uh, uh, can you kick us in by can giving me? Us Yes. OK, great. Hello. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me, Sipo. And um, this invitation, <laughs> is also um, one of me learning of Ubaba Joseph for the first time. So um, it's partly bittersweet, but I'm glad to um, at least begin this, um, this learning. So thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, I wish she was part of um, my design uh, syllabus when I was studying. Um, I have a background in fashion design and in textile design, which I had done my MA in Italy. Um, I had focused on natural dyeing, um, looking at sustainable ways of producing textile dyes, um, which was, a topic that was very new to me and um, I was lucky to have partnered with um, Kirsten Bosch to do my research um, and looking into useful plants um, and also indigenous knowledge around um, food, um, medicine, um, yeah, and also dyeing, use uh, finding color in 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 plants. Um, a little um, background uh, on my work is that I'm a weaver and um, a textile maker. I think I have um, left design uh, on on pause for a bit, but. Um, I had stumbled upon weaving by mistake. I was actually looking for a bookstore in Newlands and came across this weaving studio. Uh, it was closed at the time. I'd taken down the details. Um, and around this time, it was 2007, I was working as a pattern maker for fashion designers and a bit jaded with <laughs> the fashion industry and fast fashion and how wasteful it was. So at the time that I had found the studio, I had signed up for classes. Um, weaving had felt like a medium that had clicked with me. Um, the pace of weaving, it felt like a, a meditation as well. Um, so this has been a practice that I've kept ever since and have been trying to figure out a way of how to become a full-time weaver. Um, 
what else can I say? Um, I'd completed my MA in 2013, uh, came back to Cape Town, where I'm based, and um, have been doing a lot of self-initiated projects, working with fashion designers, uh, collaborating uh, with a furniture designer as well, Cameron. And um, one of my longtime collaborators is one of our speakers in Guli. And we have um, only done one, but had started a weaving workshop in Johannesburg in 2019. Um, out of a, a love for textile making and wanting to build community, sharing skills, um, and also engaging in more slow methods of making. Um, I've also participated in group exhibitions uh, curated by Nguli as well. Um, a lot of my work at the moment I'm drawing inspiration from, from nature, from trail running. Um, I've been recently looking at photo albums, so bringing in some personal narrative and um, memory and a lot of abstract landscapes in a sense. Um, yeah, but that is me in a nutshell. And I don't know if there's anything else I can, yeah. We will come back to you with some questions. Okay. Uh, if there are lot, if there are other people that have questions for you, uh, I I have one question. <laughs> uh, but I think what we could do is that we'll reserve all the questions for um, you know, after the all the spe speakers have spoken. Thank you, Swamali. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, Kuli. Hi. Hi. I can put my video on. Hi. Um, hi, can I can I start? I can hear you. Okay, yeah. great. So um uh, my name is Nongkulule Gom Langeni Ber and I am currently based in Sweden. Uh, but uh, as Zippo said, I'm originally from uh, Johannesburg uh, in Dachiso. And thank you so much for the invitation, Zippo. It's so cool to connect with people from home because it's so damn lonely out here. So I'm happy to be having a conversation with um, my people. And um, so my background, I, I'm not a weaver, but I have been working with weavers uh, for a while now. And how I kind of started or got into it was um, through, uh, I, I also have a, I, I, I love fashion and I used to be in that fashion space, but I actually then started doing a little bit of research around that and then realizing how destructive fashion is, but still having this appreciation for textiles and um but I was also really fascinated by how the patterns in the textiles in the continent in Africa, um, mostly West Africa, are very similar to the patterns in South America. Um, and uh, just also the interesting thing about the two cultures and the two continents and the history and all of that. So then I decided I would go to South America and um, spend time there doing research. And I did, and I missioned around Peru and um, uh, Colombia and Ecuador. And I came across artisans there and just chatting to them, finding out what they were up to and just kind of how it is in, this, in that space of textiles. And, um, and then later sharing some patterns that we had designed, uh, which were influenced by Ndebele uh, culture. And I was sharing those patterns with artisans in South America. And I worked with a man in Lima called Mario, and he was really fascinated and was even blown away by the fact that, oh, why would somebody from the African continent want to make things in Peru when we have such beautiful uh, things in the continent? And so that's kind of like how the relationship started 
with me working with textiles. And from there, I learned so much about the craft, about how the whole process of dyeing, the weaving and using chemical dye, I mean, sorry, natural dyes, uh, plants and that kind of thing. And then uh, after leaving South America, then decided that I would um, do the same thing around the Sadiq region. So I went to Namibia, uh, Lesotho, Swaziland, and then also in South Africa. And um, I actually also went to Rocks Drift, which is where Obabu Joseph was um, based, or where he studied. Um, and the, I think for me, what I took away from that, or rather the learnings from the two different continents when it comes to the textile craft is, is that uh, in Southern Africa, there's not a lot of support for the weavers. Um, and it's maybe not as valued as it felt like it was in South America. It's seen in South America, they saw it as big part of the creative economy and therefore they really supported it. And they knew that it, uh, it was bringing a lot of people and not just the textile, but craft in general. And so there was a lot of support for the artisans. And then coming back from home and actually going to Rocks Drift because I met some of the women there, they're still weaving in a church. And I was trying to work with these women um, and to try and support the, the initiative. But one of the things that were, for example, that stood out was that they were waiting for wool to come from somewhere else, from like Namibia or something, because that's the thing, like the resources in South Africa, it's, it's a whole other conversation. So we're waiting for wool for months just to arrive in Rocks Drift. And uh, and those are some of the things that kind of like started popping up. Like there was not a lot of support for these uh, women. And so since then, I've just kind of like been working to try and figure out how I can support and work with them. Um, I still work with some artisans in uh, mostly the Karoo. And um, we make all the pieces are made to order. If I get an order, I send it through to them and we work virtually and then they make the piece and then um, we send it to the client. So I'm still very much uh, working with them. And I think uh, also it's cool to be able to connect the young and old generation because one of the challenges was that there wasn't a lot of young people learning the craft and therefore it's dying out. And so, yeah, it's still work in progress. We're still trying to figure out a lot of things, but I am yeah, I'm just grateful to have that opportunity to work with them. And uh, also a lot, some of the things that pop up with on the video. Um, so yeah, it, it, that really resonated with me. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much. Thank you, Nkuli. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering if Bongi is in the room. Hi, Zipo. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I don't know what to, to switch on my video. Let me see. Mm. Is it here? Okay. Can you guys see me now? I think that's it. Yes, yes, we can see you. Hello. Hi, how are you guys? Be well, thank you. I'm well too. Um, okay, um, I don't know where to start, but I'll, I'll just read through the points that I've written down um, in regards of uh, Joe's work. Um, before I start, I would like to start with a quotation. It's a quotation from Janet Hoskins. <clears throat> and this is how it goes. Um, she says, what I discovered, quite to my surprise, why that I could not collect the histories of, okay, let me start. Okay, it says, what I discovered, quite to my surprise, was that I could not collect the histories of objects and the life histories of persons separately. People and the things they valued were so complexly intertwined, they could not be disentangled. 
Okay, so that's the quotation. Um, the reason I'm starting with that, with that quotation is that um, most of the time, or this is what I always anchor, is that um, you cannot separate the artwork from the artist. The artist cannot be separated from the artwork. So they are intertwined, they are one person. Um, so having said that, um, I'm always fascinated by the process of creation, whether from the artist's point of view or the person curating the work. I believe we all create from a place of knowing and seldom create from a place of the unknown. Hence, I was very fascinated by how Prajo speaks about his process of creation and why weaving was his chosen form of expression from other art disciplines. According to Uprajo, weaving was his escape from a lot of things that were happening around him, and it also suited his character very well, um, since he was a very quiet person. So um, this description that I've just given, it, it, it falls with many and most of other artists as well. You'll find that most artists will always describe the creative process as being enlightening, the process of remembering, the process of birthing out what was or what has been within them. So for Prajo, it was his curiosity. Prajo was very curious. So if we were looking through the film that just played, it tells us that he was curious, um, his curiosity was intertwined with the everyday stories um, that spoke to the social ills around his community and the challenges he faced as an artist. So in the film, uh, in the film that we've just watched, it talks about his visit to um, M. Shongololo. Uh, for me, that was a very interesting part of the film, um, where he talks about how the community of M. Shongololo was a melting pot of cultures, where you will find people belonging to different groups. The colors that he saw um, when he visited M. Shongololo from the different groups. Um, he says, when he speaks about it, he says it was a great awakening to know more about colors. Um, as a result, the more he weaved, um, the more he incorporated these different colors, not just in his work, but also wearing these colors on weekends when he went out. Um, he talks in the interview about how, um, like every Saturday, like in the past three Saturdays, that he will go to Mshongololo, he will dress up in these bold colors and people will always be looking at him. And they were fascinated because in the location that he was staying in, it was not a norm to see people dressed up and people wearing these bold colors. Um, but to him, it was a great awakening. He wanted to exper um, experiment with these different colors. Um, so um, the other thing that came to mind as I was working on this um, essay and watching the, the film itself was the question of, I've just heard the two speakers speaking and was the question of where do we actually box the work of Oprah Joe? And this is where it comes from. This is where the question comes from, from my side is that Oprah Joe is a very underrated artist, but he's a greatest weaver so far in South Africa. So that question resonates with that. Like, where do we place him? Because there's not much that is written about him. There's no, there's not so much research that is provided about um, Oprah Joe as who, who's the lady as Us Babari mentioned that she would have loved to have read about Oprah Joe while she was at school. So we don't actually have that curriculum that talks about Oprah Joe. So then the question that comes up to um, comes up to me is then the notion of belonging of this type of artistry. Where does it belong? To? So most of the time you will find weaving in an African. Um, in an African exhibition, that's, that's the most time you'll find weaving. But then you also now find weaving with contemporary spaces like exhibitions where they do contemporary work. They, they are starting gradually to introduce weaving as well, which is something that wasn't there for a very long time. So I guess then the next question will become in institutions um, that teach art history and teaching that teach this type of art, um, at disciplines is that do they um, do we get you weaving? Are they saying that weaving is part of art, or is it, does it fall under African art only, or is it falling under contemporary art, or is it art itself? So those are the kind of questions that I find myself asking. Um, is um, maybe if we can 
it's not even finding it a home or it's not even saying it belongs to this discipline, but then it is for us to find ways that we can implement it in the spaces that are our art galleries, that are our museums. Um, so that the only, um, I think that's the only way that we can um, hone a light on it, if it's the correct word to use. But that's the only way that we can shine a light on this type of artistry as well, that actually weaving is an artwork. It is an art piece. It is a, it falls under art disciplinary as well. So that maybe that's why people can get more involved in it and start dwelling in this type of artwork as well. So, um, also, um, I guess that was a question that I had. And then the next thing that I would like also maybe to speak about more is um, that Ubra Joe speaks about in this column as well is the, is the notion or is the use of color, how important color is. And um, I think when he started, he refers to the work that he did uh, for the Constitutional Court where it was to change the justice and the judge justice lady and changing it to this new art piece that he had to do for a constitutional court. And looking at that art, art piece, what we see in that work is the use of colors again, because he keeps going back to say that I will have never used this type of colors. I will have never used this type of bold colors. And to me, that is such a fascinating thing because then when you look at that work, you see how the different, um, how the different bold colors are not really in reflection of who we are as people in terms of that he didn't use um, the, our natural colors, like for, let's say, referring to myself, he didn't use uh, a color for a black person as the person is black or the person is brown. And with the different people that he used in that, um, tapestry, it was different colors, but in relation to what he wanted to, to put out to the world that we are actually different, yet we are one. Because the, the piece itself is called humanity, uh, is it called human, humanity, I think. So it's called Ubuntu. So it's about in, inclusion, how he was showing how people can remain in, inclusive, even though they have different skin colors and, skin, and different skin tones and also how he was using remember uh, the lady justice was just a lady who was like stretching his two arms and has these two skills uh in both of his arms but then how uh how um Racho interpreted this was in a form of people hugging each other which shows Ubuntu that we are one, we are unity, we are, everyone is inclusive. And that's actually what the instruction was from um, the constitutional court. They wanted someone who will interpret, who will lead the justice and show um, that we are one because they wanted to make the constitutional court part of the people. So it shouldn't stand on its own just as a law thing, but then it should stand as something that stands for people. So that was the other thing that was fascinating about the use of color. And also I love how he speaks on the, on the, on the film that we just watched where he goes and refers to how these colors are not standalone. And sometimes, um, maybe some people do understand this, but sometimes other people do not understand the fact that um, the use of colors, they never stand on their own, but they represent something. And it is worse when it comes to the Nguni culture. Like for us, Abekosa, we would use different types of beadworks and sorry, different types of colors in our beadwork, different types of colors in our attire, like umpak, so you'll find people have umpak or umflop, which is white. And um, with an interview that I had with the traditional healer, I was like, why are you using umpak or is part of you, um, as part of uh, or is part of traditional healers. And what she was saying to me is because of what that color white represent, which is purity. Um, so it was the same as Abe Kosa, like you'll find as we wear umpato, uh, when we get married, like when you're getting married, then you'll wear a white umpato. And that is something that stands for purity. You, you, you are pure. 
And also you'll find the other different colors that we will use in Umba, so which will be the red, which will be the okra, which is almost like an orange color. And all those different colors, they stand something, they don't stand on their own, but they mean a different thing. So that was, um, that was what was fascinating about oh, the different colors that he uses and the notion that, or the fact that he started to understand and interpret the colors that he was seeing at Shongolele, that, oh, these colors for Amandebele, they knew this, these colors for, for Abel Kosa, these colors for Abatswana, they represent a significant thing. They're not just there. So it also goes back to the colors in beadwork, like um, the different colors, like I wouldn't wear a color that a married person will wear. Those are those will be different colors, and also young men and men will wear different colors in their beadwork, which will represent something totally different. And also the even beadworks themselves and the colors that you find in beadwork, they also mean something totally different. Those were the colors that we use when people wanted to communicate something. Like for instance, in Abiz Zulu, I know they use beadwork as love letters. So they don't just use beadworks as love letters, just random beadwork colors, but then obviously they choose a certain color in the beadwork that they use. So talking about beadwork, then maybe we can also start going back to Brajo's work because Brajo talks about the, talks about the connection or let me say, he talks about the connection and the composition of how these two meet in his work. So he tells us that um, when he starts working on his own work, then he has a manner where he composes his, his tapestry in terms of dots. And where do we find dots? We find dots presented in beadworks. So he will use those same dots that we'll find in beadworks in his own work. And then when he's doing his composition for his artwork, I guess then the next thing that I would like to talk about then will be the relationship between him and the work of Mangoba, because Mangoba was also using beadworks. And he tells us that how excited he was when he saw Mangoba's exhibition, because him seeing the exhibition of Mangoba, then it meant um, he, started, um, he started thinking about his own work, he started thinking about how he has been doing his own work and how his own work has been building in terms of going in the direction of displaying or mimicking or showing these particular patterns in his own work. And he further tells us that um, when, he, he, when he started working on his, on his work, which has those um, characteristics of big working or big work markings on it, he will be, he will literally go into a dreamlike um, trance or something where he will, he will start seeing Mangoba. And to me, that was fascinating because then it goes back to the notion or where you most hear most artists, not just artists in the, in the artwork space, but artists, even those that do, that sing, um, or compose songs, then they will always tell you that um, actually I had a dream last night and that's how I got this, um, the melody that I've implemented in the song, or this is how I was able to write this chorus because I was sleeping and I was dreaming about my grandmother, but, what, but then this um, takes us back to show that there is a bit of ancestry that is also playing a role in how we we, we compose our own work, like in terms of artists, how they compose their own work. And um, I, I, I think I would like to stop there and give other people a chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Wongi Hi, welcome back everybody. Um, you know, I would like to hear from Charles, but I think before we do that, uh, there's been some uh, some conversations happening on the side, um, on the chat, uh, regarding everybody's presentation. There was one question that I had, and I think Hannah and Bridget also probably had the same question to um, towards uh, Smabalwe. 
Uh, Mabalo, you mentioned in your presentation that you wish, I think when you began, you started by saying that you wish um, you had learned of uh, Brajo while you were in school. I think also when I invited you, you did say that, uh, um, you know, you had no idea that there was a person like this that existed and uh, um, was a weaver. And so we're wondering if, um, what is it maybe that you you got from the film that you felt like it was missing from the curriculum or from what you were learning in school? Is there something in the particular? Uh, um. I think Bongi we touched on it in terms of um, there is something important about hearing. I love researching and listening to artists or makers stories, even craftsmen um, and learning how they think about um, their materials and how they make um yeah, and so I think for me that that would have been, I think it would have changed the way I thought about, I know that I'm, I'm it's part of my process now in terms of my research, but um, I think it can, it even helps all types of makers, designers, think better about the materials that they use and the impact that, the, that it has, whether it's for function um, or for a medium of storytelling. So, um, yeah, I think that's... Um, can, can I just add, I think the other thing for me that comes to mind is that also when I was doing research, there was this notion that this South Africa does not have or rather weaving is not a South African thing. It's something that's in West Africa. So you don't actually read so much. Like you know that there's uh, Abu Bakr, Fofana from Mali. There's all these like amazing artisans, weavers in West Africa, but there is not a lot of documentation of weavers in South Africa. Even the program that Ooh, Babu Joseph was in, the Rockstriff project, it's an amazing, incredible space with a lot of artisan women were making uh, tapestries, but there's not, you, you don't read about it. You don't find it anywhere. So the documentation is not there. And so, I don't know, a lot of young people don't even know about these amazing people. Um, so I, I, I also agree, no, Sisbongi, that there needs to be, I don't know, we need to do better, I think, when it comes to that. And then also, I don't know, maybe it's also because it's just seen as like just craft and it's not necessarily considered uh, something that should be included in, um, art, uh, you know, curriculums in universities or anything like that. But um, yeah, I think that conversation needs to start happening because there is definitely, a, even with beading, you know, there's a lot of... Um, beating, amazing, beautiful beating happening uh, around the continent and uh, South Africa specifically. So that is, yeah, I would, I would say that um, no, we don't know about these people and it would have been, you know, for me, also for me, when I came back, it took me a while to find weavers in South Africa. Um, a lot of them are rural, uh, based in the rural areas and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it's not... It's not common. I, and I also wanted to say one, another thing that stood out for me was the fact that when he spoke about process and how therapeutic it is for him when he's um, weaving um, and the fact that he could just be anywhere and everywhere, he could just take his loom and put it up anywhere. Um, because that, yeah, I think that is um, also something that I've learned about it, it, not everybody can actually weave because it takes so much time and one needs to be very very patient to be able to put that much energy and patience into the thing so that was um uh, great to hear from about his process and how he works and how he chooses the colors and the things that influence um his working process mm, thanks Kuli. 
I mean, talking about time, uh, weaving is quite laborious, right? Yep. <laughs> and I mean, if you're thinking about the market, so-called market, everything needs to go pretty quickly. And uh, it's such a, it's convenient that it is not uh, a popular, I guess, because it would not, uh, artists would not be able to move so quickly or, you know, create uh, multiple works for the market. But also I'm told that um, this particular piece that we're seeing now, uh, L'Ancêtre or The Ancestor, uh, that uh, Brajo is interpreting of uh, um, Enes Mangumba's painting, took about a year. <laughs> took about a year to make. Um, of course, it's complex, but I'm also wondering maybe, you know, these issues that Nguli touches on of, you know, availability of wool. Is it something that's probably that we experienced because you are in an urban environment and like the women in uh, Rockstrift, you know, the, the material, uh, uh, for instance, the wool, when you have to create your work, do you find that, you have to struggle to wait for it. Um, and also, is it also does that contribute to the reasons why you decided to, um, um, to dye your own wool? Yeah, the question of, um, oh, it's really difficult in terms of access to, to raw materials like wool, um, like mohair, um, even though when it comes to things like wool and mohair, we are, South Africa is one of the largest producers of, of both wools. Um, but we don't, we do not process the yarn. We, we send the raw materials, just like a lot of things within the continent uh, <laughs> to Europe, <Hi>. it, gets, <laughs> it gets processed and then they sell it back to us as, you know, as, as yarn and finished products. Um, and yeah, so in terms of getting the material becomes expensive. Um, I, when I was doing weaving classes, uh, it was at Montebello Design Center in, in Newlands. And my teacher, Norma Ormond at the time uh, was connected to, there's a weavers guild here in Cape Town and they had a, a store where they would sell yarn. But it, I mean, a lot of the people that were connected to the guild are hobbyists and knitters and things like that. So in terms of getting a large amount of wool, that, that now you have to look into farmers and all, yeah, uh, getting yarn sent. So when it comes to doing work like in Gulis, you need to work with people that are already established in terms of having some weavers working with them and, and access to materials. Um, it's difficult when you're starting off and you're wanting to learn and, and grow, essentially. Um, so that's a big, big issue. Mm, okay. I'd like to take it a little bit closer or back to uh, Bracho. And I'm wondering if Brachals and uh, Lede Vincent are available for uh, a little chat with us and tell us a little bit about the man. Brachals. Um, Malik, is it possible if you could unmute uh, Charles and Gosti? Hello, Malik. Hello, Brachal. Hey, Zipo. So I can only ask him to unmute. I can't actually unmute him. Oh, you can't unmute. Oh, sorry. Brachal. I'll phone Brachal and I will um, see if I can help him to unmute. Okay. All right, Bridget. Um, if there's Zipo. anyone... <laughs> um, listen, there was, a, there was another point that was very fascinating uh, about the, not the process itself, but what Ubra Joe said in, in, in the film, which was that um, because of the type of work that he did, like the, the, 
the tapestry that he did, it was mostly abstract. Like you see this one that um, you've just shown that the, the ancestor and the other different um, uh, art pieces that he did. So he was saying in, in, in the interview that uh, um, the people in Soweto didn't get this, like they didn't get what abstract is. And um, they will ask him like, why are you doing this type of work? Why not do, um, what do you call it now? Why not do, um, what is this type of um, art, art expression? But then why don't you do like um, artwork that we'll be able to understand? Like, why are you not doing uh, like artwork that has people's faces? Um, artwork that we can identify with seeming like they didn't identify with abstract. And I thought that was, that, that was, quite, um, that was quite interesting that uh, that people were struggling to to read abstract work and also people were struggling to identify with the type of work that he was doing uh, I guess it goes back to um, I guess it goes back to to the type of education that we also get in our own local schools for instance I was having a conversation I think was it two nights ago and we were having a conversation about and I was talking about where I started and I was why I started like my high school and I was saying in my high school we didn't I have artwork like I took um, art classes sorry we didn't have art classes and uh, so I was having that conversation and, and I was asking the person I was talking to, like, in, in like you growing up, did you actually go to an art class or did you in part of your curriculum in your school, was there art classes? And he was like, yes, from standard six, they did. And um, so, I'm, I'm, so what I'm trying to say, um, maybe to push or to have this, um, how can I put it? Like how maybe, maybe the kind of work that you guys are already doing, like the kind of work that Richard is already doing, taking this type of, um, taking this type of work to, um, to secluded areas where they don't get this type of teaching, maybe it's a good thing. And maybe from our, like, okay, people that are in the art history, and people that are working as curators, people that are working in um, in museums and heritage sectors, maybe they should also take it upon themselves to to um, to look at the at this type of um, this type of uh, how am I going to put it? But this type of art that is that is not inclusive that's the word yeah it's not inclusive like most of the time what you find out there in terms of articles that are written essays that are written research work that is written out there it's mostly in contemporary work it's mostly in um paintings it's mostly in what do you call it uh not even objects because there's also not that much that you find written about object, African object pieces. So maybe we should also make it our own individual agenda to say that we, we want to bring this type of conversations to areas where people cannot or people don't, or people don't have access to this type of education. Let me put it that way. Cause uh, I didn't like I, I started experiencing art when I came to Cape Town. So when I grew up, I didn't even know that this, there was this type of career that I could choose, that I wanted to go in this mainstream. This is what I wanted to study. So I always go back and I think about where I come from and I think about other kids that are growing. Like, um, I feel like maybe they are sidelined and when they are choosing careers and the things that they want to study, they don't have all the necessary information that can help them to get to the spaces such as this. So that's my two cents. So I just wanted to say something quickly. One of the things he also mentions in the documentary is the fact that he says something around, um, you know, like he is thinking like through this, he could get more opportunities. And he also mentions like the fact that he, you know, like work didn't come easy. Um, 
in terms of, of what he's doing, he got like projects here and there, and then he got the, this project with the Constitutional Hill and that opened other doors, etc. I think one of the things is that I don't think that a lot of people see this as a career that you can actually sustain yourself or use to make a living out of. Um, and I think also, you know, in a lot of places and spaces seen as like this domestic thing, it's not necessarily the thing that you go out to study. You, you know, you don't want to be a weaver because you're not going to make a living out of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I, I mean, that I, I, I feel that in terms of maybe including it into the curriculum, I think a lot, it would be very, it would be an amazing thing if it was included in school curriculums, but I, doubt that it's seen as something that one can sustain themselves or make a living out of, as, well, at least in, in South Africa at the moment. So maybe that's also one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Thank you, Ngoli. Uh, Brachel, I'll see you unmuted. Hello, Brachel. Hello. Hello, you've known now Brajo for a very long time, going back to Rock Strips. Can you please speak, tell us a little bit about, about him? Okay, this, this man that I'm looking at here is one of the best weavers in the land. And in his endeavors, he was trying to unweave the heavy concepts in the creative spirituality of an artist of Mangoba's stature who, who made it uh, a task for Bridget and the team to, to go even to the Johannes Beckard Gallery uh, library to, to, to get a piece that would be ideally suited for the gift that was intended for the Constitution uh, Court. So Joe had no competition in this arena because I remember when we were in Rock Street, he was the best student uh, who was interwoven with the spirituality of weaving, the creative uh, domain that makes uh, weaving to be associated with a complex story using wool, uh, paint, and stuff. But knowing him as I do, I remember when we went to to one of the the, the, the local doyens of weaving, Margaret Stevens, and. She helped us uh, with the donation of wool to, 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 to introduce local school teachers in Soweto through workshops, to introduce them to weaving. And Joe was there for the taking. And he did a marvelous job. And uh, Margaret Stevens would say he enthused on Joe being much better than him because he would take a concept, put it, uh, commit it into a cartoon, a cartoon that would be put uh, in the in the warp, and from that warp, Joe would start. Uh, putting color in, 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 into the warp. And uh, to this, Margaret Stevens would say, and uh, he respects, he, he holds very high esteem for this great man because Joe would start from the cartoon to, 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 to laying the warp uh, and even making sure that uh, the, 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 the students understand the connection between Joe, me, and Vincent, and Rock Street. So Joe was that kind of person who, who, who gave an essence of immortality to the great work um, 
of Uba Uma Inoba, the title of the work was uh, The Ancestor. And the, 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 the motion, the spiritual motioning of the composition made it uh, like an art piece for all seasons because when you, you look at it closely, you could see some uh, snippets of the 1976 riots, but all done in wood. And also, one thing that made me respect this great guy was he injected the picture playing or the, 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 the loom with a spirit of immortality because that work ended up being a very, very complexly uh, put together work of art. And he and he alone would say why he took such a long time to finish the tapestry. Joe, in his uh, nature, uh, was a, a, a very tenacious person who, who took time in even painting and printmaking because he was also good in printmaking and painting. And in Rockstrip, we were together with him uh, when we were doing uh, third year, but Joe was selected as a, a, a chain link for the long, for, for the learning process that would conjoin the trainee weavers to understand the dynamics of art theory, the colors, what uh, color does to a work of art. We were also study, we had also studied basic design, color balance, and all that. But it was quite uh, exciting to note that you know some of the people who would cross the Umzinyati River to come to to the to 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 Rock Street to to ply their trade in in weaving. Those people um, had their works showcased in places like Florence in Europe and many other spaces in the world. And Rogue Strift ended up being a very important uh, developmental sphere in the world of creativity in South Africa that made Joe I think may his soul rest in peace because he was also very closely uh, attached to Umam Ali Nandebele, who had spent years in Sweden uh, doing weaving. So Ucho, when you look at his work, you find that it's like, the, 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 the chaotic, the sweet chaotic world in motion that portrays whatever it is that you would like it to, 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 to convey. Uh, it's like there's a storm. There is, we would play the CD uh, with Abdul and, uh, and, uh, Bridget, where we would say, you know, this work is one of a kind because it, 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 it becomes a creative genius out of the box. A box composition would say, we would like to see the 76 riots as they were, but the essence of movement in the tapestry says a lot and that is the biggest scale in my time with Joe that made me realize that this man, you know, you, you associate him with how good it is to stay hooked and to stay 
committed in anything that you do. When we were together at Abangani Open School, by the way, he, he spent some, some, some time teaching the weaving to the trainee weavers in Rostri, but in, in, in Devon, he found that uh, it's not only art that counted. Joe was a multifaceted creative genius who organized, you know, bands, music bands like the Milo Poets, where there was the late uh, Ben Langa and Eugene Skiev, and also tied up for his photographic angle with Omar Bacha. And uh, we also had lots of uh, young fundis in the, in the tertiary institutions who, who, who kind of donated uh, teaching to the open school. So in the open school, there were guys who would uh, groom students in poetry and in dance, like I would uh, remember Rose Diggs. And uh, there would also be uh, people who would come to Rose Street to, to, to introduce students to drama. And jo, uh, Joseph Dovo changed the whole complexion of creativity in and around Devon. Mind you, he took me into my, from my own donated creative pocket of making art in Merenhead, which was donated to me by the late Duke Kedje. Then he said, Charles, uh, you cannot survive by uh, being a full-time artist. The Institute of Race Relations has created this space to make kids in and around Devon to be uh, made to have access towards uh, making art. So I said, no, so what do I do? Then he said, you were chosen to look at the textile design site. I also taught watercolor there, but uh, my uh, uh, Lille Moore Johnson um, uh, introduced me to, to the thread of how it is to make a textile design suitable for the print make, for the textile printing uh, studio at Rock Street. So I was hooked up onto that and here we were. We also introduced students into tie dyeing and into all sorts of things that made uh, the open school a very unique space that had other branches somewhere around the country, like uh, in Maritzburg, Peter Maritzburg, in PE in Cape Town, and the one in Johannesburg, and which was more like put together by the late, um, may God uh, bless his soul, Colin Smarts. So, Joe never said no, even though I bought a home in Johannesburg in Soweto. Uh, I'm not prepared to, 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 to ply my trade in Soweto. Let me take a challenge and go to Devon. Started uh, with a, a missionary kind of setting in Umlazi and uh, ended up um, getting the space in, in, in Queen Street where the studio was made available and we made friends with the 
uh, Fine Arts Department of the of what is now called Devon uh, University of Technology. So we got guys like Jan Yordan, uh, John Room, Hugh Dent, and many others. And, and it was also through the hospitality that we gave to Julius Mashang, who had visited uh, Maryland Hill. We were visited by the the, 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 the D, D, U, T team and they were thrilled by the the, 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 the colored uh, prints, etchings of Mr. Mashang, who is now based in the UK. But Joe was a man for all seasons when it comes to art making. And he, even though he was a person who was basically quiet, but when at times we, we would joke, he would say, Charlie, are you aware that we created um, a solid base for young guys then, like Sipom Danda, who, 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 who clung on to, 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 to the famous photographer. Uh, and he, from that time on, because he was also a student of art at Mzuba in Devon. So, a lot of things we had Zuele to Tetra, the site who we recommended to to Jules Van der Weber in the at the UCT in Cape Town, who was quite thrilled by the prowess and competence of this young man from a historically disadvantaged institution like the Abangani open school and the, 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 the name Abangani, open school, it was like bringing young minds together for soul searching and making sure that uh, all these kids are introduced into art making. But it couldn't have happened if Joe was not there. We lost a great hero and this, uh, you know, we got so hooked up when we, we were there for the documentation of the tapestry and then said, wow, this is quite amazing. And, you, you, you know, when um, uh, Margaret Stevens said, no, I can't do this. I only do the color separation of a tapestry by great art making minds. Uh, but Joe does it all on his own. Color separation, weaving, laying the warp and all that. And uh, Joe was also introduced to the marvelous working environment of Margaret Stevens, who even today hasn't forgotten the great guy. And we, we, we won't stop mourning the development that uh, fate uh, came up with. The development that deprived us of Christ being developed by we were left with very, very uh, sore hearts. We got young guys who have since become very, very great people. And we also can even say in Cape Town, we got people and we, we've got other artists who have made 
Cape Town, like Mpati Kotrini, who was also in Rock Street and also very in much influenced by the skills that uh, Prajo gave to him to be able to make uh, printmaking good. And the other guys who were very close to, to Joe were Ben Susha, who was introduced to the Peter Marisbeck Center, at Center by Joe. And uh, we had, under the Madling was a family who made sure that Marisbeck is not left out in the court. So, we we find that Job became a, 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 a very, very solid motor of progress. And not to mention also the marvelous work that uh, the artist, and uh, I, I mean the Abangani uh, Open School got through having great music minds like A.B. Trindy, Patsy Folosha, Pat Mkoka, Sam Shavalala, and all those guys who even went abroad into Europe to, 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 to spread the South African gospel in unpacking music as though South Africa needed to come out of the box in order to showcase its potentiality to the rest of the world. But without this man, who became the nucleus of development in Devon, all the way from Jabla Air, from Zondi in Soweto. But he ended up settling in Devon, and uh, whilst in Devon, he made it his business that he wakes up every day to go and spread the gospel of empowerment through the arts. And uh, maybe before I, I, I put, there is something uh, that we all ripped from the tree of genius, Kababu Manova, when asked about uh, how we felt about the other cultures in the world, he would say no. I don't associate <coughs> myself, meaning him, as an entity that comes from South Africa, but I look at myself as the global citizen. And what a, 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 a nice way to put it, global citizen, from a man who left South Africa in 1938 to Blyth Strait in Paris. Well, he met with a lot of problems because there was soon to be the Second World War. So, but <coughs> we, we have been lucky to have people like Manova, like, uh, like uh, Babu Pemba, uh, like uh, oh, 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 oh. Many, many more artists who we've been proud to have had. And the other person who played a very important part, linking the Avangan Open School with the theater, was the late Matsumela Mana, who introduced us to Ketan Lakani, who was the doyen of theater in Devon at that time. So, but it's it, it's good that Devon is still thriving. Uh, but we will miss a person like Joe, who I think is irreplaceable. He's an undying mortar of immortality. You know, when a a a, a mortar is put is put in between the bricks, it makes sure that for longevity to thrive, the, 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 that uh, permanent sila makes sure that our culture never is never wished away from the face of this earth. So I think 
you know, you, you, Baba Ting, me, me seem to, Ibong was in Zizwa, I paid. Ujo has left a legacy. And in a very short space of time, whenever he had interviews, I mean, workshops in weaving at Funda, you would find stunning things, works done by Buyong Li Luana uh, and many other students. But Joe uh, even con well, attracted the attention of the wife of Ubabum Bu, who had been exiled in America for quite some time, and they collected Amawaxak. But there's this one is a world beater, and I wish I could see it on the 29th because, uh, you know, the spirituality and the crosswinds of creativity that one reads through the vertical strings that are intercepted by color uh, with the intention of making sure that shapes come about. And you, you, you don't force yourself to search would you, what is it that I see there, but Joe would say, no, take a trip. Look at it. There's no prescription that says, this is how this work has got to be looked at, because it's the ancestor. The ancestor is something that you can barely touch. So, but it's, it's better than getting South African art from Europe as a totally repatriate, but this one would never be repatriated because it was a gift uh, coined together by Joseph Begizizwendo and Art and Ubuntu Trust for it to be donated to the Constitution Hill at Ghana. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Brad Charles. Uh, I can listen to you all day. <laughs> I'm sure that's the same for everybody. <laughs> but was I I'm, clear? I'm really looking forward to uh, the session that focuses on your work next year. <laughs> um, <laughs> So if there's anyone here who's interested in that session, uh, please you, subscribe. You, you, you know, for all this to happen, something that preceded uh, the, the, the exhibition of the great guy in 2006 in Cape Town, and all that couldn't have happened with the without the magical touch that was contributing to trust because it, it transformed the art making landscape in Cape Town in 2006 and made us realize that Johannesburg is not the only thing that you can boast about when you're in South Africa. Cape Town has got it. And uh, Africans of all races. I remember lately we went and saw the Nobel Center, which told me an open pages of thrills. There was an exhibition that was going to be opened by the legendary Carol Nell. Uh, there and uh, curating the works of Jackson Kromwane um, and uh, Jackson Kromwane and William Kentridge. So just the thrill that one saw that no, we were captivated in thrills and thunders of excitement and we we were very happy to see that Cape Town is squatting. But in closing, I would say 
and let us uh, acknowledge Bridget Thompson and Abdul and all the other guys who were there and including also paying tribute to the last punctuation marks of uh, life. So badly taken away from him, the life of uh, in times of Ezekiel Gudeli, who left us, uh, died in hospital about almost two months ago. But we have been together as a unit that was interwoven with the thrills uh, uh, provided by by uh, Ubuntu Trust and also the majestic funding that has been provided by uh, the National Lottery. Couldn't have happened. But like you see in this picture, the, the, the art education is like these fingers of Babunjo trying to 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 inter to be to get interspersed on the vertical strings, like you would realize when playing a stringed instrument. Joe made that weaving possible. And because the work still lives, so will he, and so will his spirit be. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, Bridget, a, a while ago you had your hand up. Um, you, I was not ignoring you. Uh, if you are still up to commenting or if you had a question, um, could you please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Zippo. I, I really wanted to thank Bra Charles because he's given such a beautiful story of Bra jo and the whole, um, all the different artists who were together in Durban at Abangani Open School and um, Bra Jo's impact in, in Soweto at the Funda Center and so on. But what Bra Charles doesn't mention is that Bra Charles himself is the foundation of the Art and Ubuntu Trust educate, art education work. He and his late comrade, our late comrade, and I call him a comrade very deliberately, Ezekiel Bordelli, because he was a warrior for art. Um, they would go and visit Brajo often while he was weaving to keep his spirit up and to keep him strong. And in fact, it was Bra Charles's idea. And he in fact introduced Brajo to us. And that was how the whole project of the weaving for, for the Constitutional Court came about. So we have much gratitude towards Bra Charles and much appreciation of what we've learned from him. And it's so wonderful to look in the chat and to see what people are saying as they're listening to you talk, Bra Charles. They want to meet you. They want to talk to you. They want you to tell them more about what you've shared today. And Bongiwe, who wrote about um, Bra Jo, said she, you've answered some of her questions that she had. And this is so wonderful. And I'm so glad that today you're using Zoom because with Zoom, we can continue to be in contact with each other. Even if we can't actually come to see you in Soweto, we can continue with Zoom and, and have these relationships. And the other thing that I found, if, if I may continue, Zippo, um, that um, the, this, I find today's session so touching and so beautiful because first of all, Brajo, being such a quiet person, he takes you into his thoughts and he takes you into this consideration of color and color is everything. Our life is completely determined by color. And he, he, he gives you such a careful reflection on color and so touching to see, to hear what Zibabal was doing and in Kululeko also, what they're both doing in terms of weaving. Because I remember many years ago when I studied African history at the University of Cape Town, hearing that there, there was weaving in pre-colonial South Africa, which died out completely. And then of course, we know that Angora goats um, and Merino sheep were introduced by the 1820 Thirtlers, my ancestors in the Eastern Cape. And there are these massive farms with that produce um, 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 mohair and wool 
And um, La Duma Ngokolo has taken the, 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 the colors of, of um, beadwork and introduced them into, into his work, which is you know, on international catwalks. But of course, there's so much that we can still do here. And there was just something um, earlier on in the chat, chat um, Elizabeth Perrell was talking about the need for um, more appreciation of, of, of craft. And I think there's really such a problem in our education system. And this is you know, something we've learned from taking Ernest Mangalpa's work seriously and from taking Brad Charles's educational guidance towards us seriously. And that is that in fact, we have two systems of art. It's, almost, it's wrong to call certain art expressions craft. We have two systems of art in South Africa. We have the Western system and we have the African system. So you, if you go to museums and galleries, you'll find um, beadwork exhibited as art, but bead workers are called crafters. And there are a whole lot of implications from calling bead workers and weavers crafters, when in fact they're artists. They're artists working in a different system. If, if they're called crafters, it, it has implications for how their work gets sold, for their autonomy in terms of their expression, for the autonomy in terms of their design. Um, and Paula in the chat raised something extremely important, and that is the, 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 the nature of um, massive agricultural cartels, which possibly make it difficult for South Africans to get access to wool. So there are a whole lot of issues here in terms of um, unfinished transformation in, in our society. But the one that we at the Art and Ubuntu Trust are most concerned about is the, is the art curriculums in schools and at university, because they're very mixed up, they're very confused. Um, and there are racist understandings of what is art. And that's a whole discussion, which hopefully we'll have next year as well, when we have a session on indigenous visual heritage. But um, I, just to finish, just to say, it's so deeply touching that today, um, Roger connected with young weavers, young dynamic weavers. It was so beautiful to hear the young dynamic weavers speak um, and to hear what you're doing and to hear the efforts that you're making to make these connections. And um, it was, it's always a treat to hear Bra Charles um, weave a story as well. And Bongiwe's thoughtful analysis of um, Bra Joe's work, we, we really hope that Bongiwe, as you continue with your academic work, that you'll continue to keep his memory and his thoughts and his very profound analysis of color alive because he was one of the few people who really understood Ernest Mangmoba's colors in a very profound way um, from his own relationship with South African colors. So we've, we've started to touch on these things, but we haven't in any way got close to them. So I really hope that this, this work will continue and that we can, we can um, that these connections that have been made today will continue in, in some practical way. Thanks. Um, can I speak just one more line? Uh, that uh, we have to identify people out there who, who can be the engine room of continuity of a spirit that will uh, prevail at the Constitution Hill on the 29th, that uh, organizations like the, like Art and Ubuntu Trust are given an undying leave, lease of existence because of the service they have been to us all as South Africans. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Prashas. Abdul Kada, I see you have your hands up. Hello. Yes, good afternoon, good evening. Greeting to everyone and greeting to Bracharus. What I want to tell you is a comment, and I'm, I, I was hearing the, um, the, what do you call it, the recording of the young girl who said that uh, they have taught them that there is no history of weaving in Southern Africa, unless it's not from West Africa. But the question that comes in, that, that it reminds me that there are some historians or uh, some people who, who protect the Western notion of uh, supremacy. 
who says that Africa does not have a history. <laughs> Africa, or people who say Africa is an invention of the Western world. But the question is that the African people, if there was no weavers, what they were wearing skins as they usually protect, project in the anthropological terms that the African people were animal hides and skins, but not clothes, and they don't know how to weave. So that is a, a complete lie. But uh, oh, <clears throat> that is one of the misinformation or miseducation that we receive today in those schools or academics or anything else. That is what I only I wanted to mention about uh, what they call it there. The point that I would like to make, and Bracharis thanks you for that beautiful explanation of uh, what they call it, uh, right, Joseph and Lobo. But I remember one thing when we were working together, I asked him, uh, are you a gentleman? He said, I might look a gentleman, but it's something else to be defined, he said. <laughs> so, but the, the gentleman, the term gentleman is not in the British or Anglo terms, but is a, is a form of saying that he looks deeper than being a gentleman. So he looks deeper than being a gentleman. And he revealed that he's a quiet. And uh, I remember him when we went together to that other weaver, which I don't remember that lady, Bridget remembers the name. And we asked her that he is going to do the Mokoma. She said, he is the only madman, mad one who can do the, such, uh, to take up the, such, such kind of challenge to make that kind of work. And he succeeded in doing that. And I remember him photographing, remembering with the, what do you call it, with a, a late brother who worked with us, who was photographing him every day during the process and recording it. And how it was serious for him to go through that process. May his role rest in peace. And uh, I'm glad, I'm proud to have met him, not only him, but all most of the artists that we work together in Art and Boot. That is what I want to share with you. And Charles and Kosi, stay well and safe. We have a lot of things to do together. Thank you. Thank you to Kader and thank for the work that you do. Nkole, you have your hand up. Hello. Um, yes, I just wanted to say, firstly, just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this. I am so humbled. Bongi, thank you so much. And Dr. Chelsea, thank you, Rialewo. And I also wanted to ask if it's possible to somehow um, have maybe follow up conversations or just to ask, because for example, in Tate Charles, you mentioned Ina uh, Debele, whom I've also never heard of. And I Googled her as soon as you mentioned her name and she was also doing such incredible work. And also hearing that she spent a lot of time in Sweden and I'm here in Sweden and I would like to know more about him, her and if it's possible to access her work here in Sweden, maybe I can go look at the archive. So, if there's any more information that we can get um, about some of these men and women who were in Rock's Drift and how do we access that information because it's not online. So I, I just, basically I'm just curious to know how do we uh, learn about these amazing people and, and how can we take that further? Um, yeah, it's really humbling. And I just also wanted to say, just seeing the pictures of uh, Brajo, he looks like any uncle from Soweto, you know, that you could have bumped into without even knowing that he was such a, a gift, you know. And um, yeah, and his work is really incredible. And I'm, I'm truly, really humbled and grateful. And for all the stories that you shared with us, and we will do our best to take them forward. Thank you. Okay, just uh, the last punctuation mark. Uh, get try to get hold of Marlene Lundbom, who was also one of the teachers in our time with you at Rock Street. Marlene Lundbom 
uh, is from Sweden, and also through um, Bridget and Abdul, you can somewhat access the whereabouts of uh, our great brother, um, Lefifi Tladi. Lefifi Tladi, because South Africans, they know who is where doing what. They can be far away from home, but uh, Mam Alina is one of the elements and the, 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 the muscles that conjoined to make such a giant like Joe. So I think I wish you could get that. Great. Thank you so much. And also, um, also, if any of you are still connected to the Rocks Drift project, it would be uh, um, great to have a chat because that place has so many gems and um, some of the resources, for example, the screen printing resources and the looms and everything. Um, I honestly would have loved to collaborate and work with the ladies there, but it was really challenging. So if anyone has more information on how we can still connect with Rocks Drift and how we can work with them, it would be great. Also get hold of Tammy Jali. I think uh, Bridget has got the number of Tammy Jali. Tammy Jali is a former student of um, uh, T.U.T. and Rockstrift. And uh, I think we do need to have some contact. Like we've got people like Sam Zanetwa, like uh, Pat Mautra, like Bongi Wedlomo, who can be very resourceful in trying to look at what exists beyond the horizon. <laughs> Uh, leading us to Rock Street because there is a, you know, thrills and thrills of an ending creativity that you can get there, whether it be it, uh, uh, um, what's this, um, uh, pottery, like, uh, uh, Textile printing and all that. You, 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 you will be amazed that you know at all odds a positioned stroke of existence, and they don't know where to go in order to be able to earn a living. But in Rostrip. People who, were, who hardly went to school but became, you know, internationally acclaimed masters, like Lady Scraba, who was one of the, the, the products of Umam Ali Nandevele, and many more others, and also the Katlawong Art Center here in Johannesburg. There are people who have been to Rock Street. So it, it doesn't end here, it can continue and continue. Amen. <laughs> yeah, boy. Bridget, did you want to add anything or ask some goodly? No, I, I wanted to um, uh, say some thanks. I don't know if that's too soon, um, Zipo, in terms of the program. You can say thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, if, if nobody else wants to say anything, um, I, I wanted to particularly thank you today, Zipo, because I think that your curation of the speakers has really been very um, imaginative and you've, you've really put people together who have benefited from being connected with each other on these sessions. And today was really a case in point. It was so wonderful to, to, um, to have these conversations with Brajo, in relation and and um, with Sibabalwa, with Nkululeko, with Bongiwe and with Bra Charles to, to connect to Brajo. I love the picture of him that's up at the moment. It really shows his his depth and his profundity. So Zipo, thank you very much. You've been very, very creative in the way you've brought people together and made these sessions really um, very profound and very um, 
and, and, and moving actually today. I found today very, very moving. Thank you. And, and I also want to thank um, Malik in the background because Malik, Malik is behind the Art and Ubuntu Trust symbol, but he's doing all the managing of the sound and the images and, and so on. So Malik, I don't know if you want to show your picture just quickly, um, um, but thank you very much for, for all of that. And, um, you know, the, this, the, the work that we've done in the Art and Ubuntu Trust, you know, today is our last session for until next year. We've got another 10 or 12 we can do next year. And Bra Charles will feature in one of them. So um, I, I hope you'll, you'll all be back for that. Um, but it, it's really been an extraordinary collective, collective work. I've been at the heart of the administration of it, but the, the work has been driven by inspiring artists and inspiring um, arts educators, starting with Brad Charles and Ezekiel Brajo, who we met later, and, and others. So, so this is really a collective expression of really, really amazing work on the part of artists who themselves have fought to be artists, have fought to, 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 um, to be artists and also to make sure that other people could become artists in South Africa under the most difficult circumstances, which unfortunately haven't yet really changed adequately. Um, but I also wanted to mention there are a couple of people here who, who come very often and I wondered if any of them would like to make a closing statement before we before we close for the year. I mean, and and I hope you'll 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 all come back. I know Sheppy is somebody who comes often. I don't know if he's still online. He spoke at the very first one, very powerfully. We really appreciated it. Um, Imru's spoken at one, and he's here. Pindile, we would love you to 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 say a word. If if there's anybody else here. And also our, our speakers today, if, if they want to say anything more. Barbara's here. She's been with us from the very beginning. Elaine, Ernest Mangalba's old friend. We've, we have heard him the last um, couple of weeks. It's been wonderful. It's wonderful to have you again, Elaine. Um, and um, if Wendy, who works with us. And there's some new people as well um, who, who, who I think have come on especially for today. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say if there's anybody else who'd like to say something in, in general, it would really be nice to hear from you before we close for the year. And a big, big, big thank you to Zipo. Zipo's really, um, really curated a very, very nice program. We appreciate it very, very much. Um, yes, I just really want to um, say thank you. I think this has been incredible incredibly inspiring and enriching. There have been many times where I've wanted to give up <laughs> in, um, in practicing such a um, giving, a giving medium that I've found in weaving. Um, and it has been a shame that it's been such a difficult digging of our um, of our weavers, such as U, Ubaba Joseph. So um, a lot of the questions um, that I had in Guli had, had asked. So there's nothing more than just thank you. Can I? Yes. Is it okay to say something or Elaine? Is this Pindile? Yes. Yes. A few words. Uh, uh, I would like also to thank you very much for that beautiful session, and, uh, to the work you have done. And uh, I am very pleased to have seen uh, Joseph and the tapestry and uh, all that discussion on colors. Uh, it reminds me when Ernest used to say, uh, colors is my drawing, you know. Okay, I would like also to mention that first his son, Mark Wanga, who was a great guy, a very close friend of mine, uh, before doing color, used to draw in black and white only. And he said for him, it was a sort of step forward to pass from drawing in black and white to drawing in colors. Colors was a real world for, for, for Mark Wanga. And 
of course, for, for Ernest. So I am very pleased to be with you and uh, to, I would like to, to, to say how, how moving is that, that, <laughs> that session. And I am so sure, so pleased to, to see Ernest Mankova being so, so appreciated. And also I would like to say that Joseph is doing his own work, like he's in sort of a, a, a translator, but translating must be understood as a creation as well, as such as well, you know? So from, from, a, uh, from a piece of art done by Monkova, Joe do another piece of, of art. And this is really moving and it's sort of base of future creation. This is lovely. <laughs> so I wish to all the best. And also, also I would like also to thank you again, to thank Bridget and Africa for all the work they have done, which is really impressive. That's it. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Pindile, you can unmute yourself. Well, good afternoon, um, everyone. I just want to take this opportunity and express my gratitude, um, particularly for today's session and all others. But I do want to acknowledge the contributors, panelists uh, from today's session who have really enriched and, and broadened one's um, knowledge base. There's never ever enough to learn. There's always room to grow. And today has been a session with such a, with such um, evidence that um, we can only learn from each other. But more principally, I'd like to thank from the bottom of my heart, thank Bridget Thompson for the labored commitment of the last, I mean, I've known Bridget for, 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 for decades. I'm not even going to say because it's gonna reveal how old I am. <laughs> but, but the last two decades that I have at some point um, felt that she had been spammed by the journey and needed to walk away from it for a little bit, but Bridget was not even to hear a word of advice from a friend. She would continue doing the work as Thomas Films and then with Art and Ubuntu. Bridget, your 16 years of commitment and investment has today as we um, part ways with the last session for 2021 has shown the fruit. The African, um, the African proverb that goes, if you want to live legacy, plant a tree because it will be there long after you had departed. Listen, this is an archive of indigenous knowledge that cannot be taken away from our people, that has been created by our people. Because this work, although you were an anchor, this work was, this work was, community effort. And you know what they say about if the elders are not healthy in the village, so will the children be unhealthy. But you were able to identify distinctive genius and brought all of it to gift some of us and all who cares to come and drink from this world. Thank you. Abdul Kada, 
for your offbeat methods of producing documentary films and ever so challenging to one's um, centered knowledge. That has been just a wonderful journey to take a ride on with both of you and everyone who contributed to this culmination. Bro Charles, I haven't forgotten you. I know you've been on the journey yourself, but from where I stand, I cannot wait for Art and Ubuntu Trust to have a session on you because as you have seen, everybody who is on, on the platform has experienced the oratory of Brad Charles, the quiet and tranquil genius of Brad Charles with words, language, which is what language anchors whatever expression we have. Wait until you see a full on exhibition of his work. What you have seen today was just a preview. So I am so grateful, but at the same time, very touched that uh, Brajo is not here to see the unveiling on the 29th of October. He, he has, I'm sorry people, I'm very, I'm cheery when it comes to this because yes, he's not here. And I would have very much loved for him to see this. Um, but what he has bequeathed on us is just too amazing. So it is our, our work, the next job we commit to as a collective, as individuals, is to ensure that the world gets to know about his work. And so do I make a commitment. I'm just a mere writer, but I'm sure the artists who have bigger platforms can take this ball forward to a future that is blessed with and, 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 and littered with the African aesthetics in the paradigm as well as in our narratives. As we take it back, as we own it, as we give to the world with what we know is our own. I really have an appreciation and thank you so much to everyone and thanks Bridget and Abdul and everyone that we got to work with when I did uh, play a cameo role in some of the work that you all invited me to contribute to. Rachel, thanks for a beautiful, profound profile, not only today, because today was synoptic, but I'm talking about the writing you did on Brajo. Thank you. And that's me signing out for 2021. See you in 2022. Bye now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, anyone wants to go? Wants to go in? Before we say goodbye. I want to, to add something about uh, there was a, a lady who asked what's happening in the 29. 29, it will be the unveiling of um, the tapestry that you saw the film today at the Constitutional Court with a bust made by Mankoba and a short film made by Artun Ubuntu about reading the ancestor. And Brad Charles, it's not physically that is going to happen that, it's going to happen virtually. So on Zoom, we will happen the event. So it's nothing that nobody will go there. Due to the Madame Corona, we have to stay in our homes and uh, deal with the with electronics and everything. So that is what happened. So I think that Pululeko asked that yes. question and I, I replied to her. Thank, Thank you. you. That is I'm happy it's happening online so I can also be part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Sipo. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, Nkoli. Thanks, uh, Sibs. Thanks, Wongiwe. Bridget Abdul Kadir. Thanks, Bra Charles, and everybody else that joined us today and who is joining us in the future. Uh, for those that are not yet to, uh, subscribed to our mailer, do that. You can go on to uh, at and Ubuntu's website at ubuntu.org. And at the bottom of the first page, you can subscribe over there and you will receive all our, uh, all our uh, newsletters. And also, if you missed the last 11 sessions, do not just there. You can go on to uh, at and Ubuntu Trust YouTube channel. The sessions are there. The films are not there, though. But if you're an educator or if you know of anyone who um, needs these films to assist them, uh, in, in the classroom or who is an art uh, facilitators, you can drop us an, uh, an email um, at feedback at artubuntu.org or for general inquiries, you can uh, just email inquiries at uh, artubuntu.org. Um, yes, that's it for 2021. Should we say Happy New Year? <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but you know what? There's something that we like doing here, but we have not been consistent. Um, to take a, a photograph of all the faces that are currently present. So if you can, please, uh, this is not going to take too much of your data. If you can, please just switch on your video uh, and then just hang there, hang there. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Bali. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Marcia, hello. Brashepi, please, your video. We're missing your face. <laughs> hello. Imru. <laughs> hello. Barbara. <laughs> Cindy, the oil and PJs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. We've snapped. Uh, thank you for coming. And yeah, let's see you next year. Bye. On the 29th. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>